Let me just quickly talk about the state of the state I represent. I come from Telangana. My name is KT Ramarao. I am the Minister for Industries, Commerce, Information Technology, Urban Development. I've had the privilege of uh, serving as a minister for the last three and a half years for the youngest state in India, that is Telangana, with Hyderabad as the capital. Today we have India's largest technology incubator in Hyderabad called the T-Hub, which has been doing exceedingly well. And come this time next year, by this time next year, we will be having the world's largest technology incubator slash startup engine in our own city of Hyderabad right here. In fact, innovation has been a huge driver in the growth story of Telangana in the last three and a half years. Our Honorable Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Modi, for the first time in Indian history, for the first time in the history of this country, talks about startup India. He realizes the importance of innovation, he realizes the importance of skills. He talks about startup India, he talks about skill India, and he also talks about how to ensure that this large demographic dividend, which is up for the grabs for India, because more than 50% of our population is less than the age of 27. More than two thirds of India today is less than the age of 35. So that goes to tell you, India has the largest think force. I don't like to call it workforce. India today has the largest think force on the planet for any country in the history of the planet. As the world is aging, India is getting younger. Um, Chandar, okay, um, you have a very ambitious ICICI digital village outreach program. You've already uh, targeted 11,000 villages across 17 states, and out of which you've already created 7,500 women entrepreneurs. So what, what goes into ensuring that these women entrepreneurs in these villages from the rural settings, how are they empowered? How do you ensure? That, I'm sure there must be obstacles in trying to bring them into the workforce. I'm sure there must be a lot of challenges. How, how do you overcome that? And how do you also ensure that they stay on top of their game? And how do, you, how do they keep uh, sustaining what they do? Long periods, people can work from home and they do not lose out on their career progression if they're working from home. Fantastic. Fabulous. Uh, the other thing that we've started lately is actually to say that any mother who's got a child up to three years of age, we, and if that mother travels overnight for office work, we of course pay for the mother because she's going for office work, but we also pay for the travel of the child and the travel of a caretaker so that the mother can take the child and take it away. Fabulous, fabulous. Chandra. So these are, these are some of the things in an, in an organizes, uh, organizational environment. But coming to our skill training initiative, you know, we've started a whole skill training initiative across India. Uh, and through that, what we've done is we train those underprivileged youth who are not able to afford higher education. For that, we pick skills which are actually relevant for this kind of youth. So we have about 24 training centers in urban and semi-urban areas in the country plus around 500 villages where we have taken the skill training initiative. The training skills that we've picked vary from something like a tractor assembly and a tractor repair to electricals to dress designing, garmenting, web designing, and office administration and selling skills. And what we have seen is that as we take these training skills, especially to the rural areas, we have more and more young women joining these training skills. So I'm very proud to say that we train about 100,000 youth every year, and of that, 55% are women. Fantastic. A big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. More than 55%. That's amazing. That's amazing. And, and, and this is what we were talking about before with, with really so much of the leadership happening in the private sector and government taking these great programs and fueling them and, and really bringing them to scale. So, you know, some of the most successful examples of skills training we've seen when we've looked across the globe at various apprenticeship opportunities are when government teams up with industry or government teams up with technical schools, community colleges, creates 
its curriculum, and then that curriculum is taught to students, and then on the other side, they, they get a job from a, of a private sector employer. So really creating that ecosystem and making sure there's an alignment with the classroom skills and a curriculum that will actually lead to a good paying job, and a lot of it's outside of the traditional four-year college track. I think in America, we've gotten so focused on the importance of university that we've really done a disservice to a lot of people who could have had great paying jobs, who could have gone a different route, who could have learned skills um, and maybe had skills better suited to, um, to the work that they wanted to do um, and would have benefited from, from technical education or apprenticeship and real on-the-job training. So I think there's a tremendous opportunity in what you're describing and 100,000 people a year. That's amazing. So. That's 55% plus um, uh, employment in the rural economy. Let me go back to you, Karen. In Dell, you, you're leading a couple of very interesting inclusiveness and diversity initiatives. One which is called is Women in Search of Excellence, WISE acronym, and then you also have another very interesting program, Men Advocating Real Change, or MARC. You want to talk about it a bit more? Sure. I mean, this is an area that is clearly near and dear to, to, to uh, us, and I'm sure is um, important to everyone in, in the audience. You know, you ask the question, what are, what are companies need to do to get more women into leadership roles and, and help with skills? We launched a couple of years ago unconscious so social bias training. The biases that exist in society today, you, Cherie talked about some of them when it comes to women and you know, ma being married and those types of things, they have to be addressed. Men need to be part of those conversations and that's what we did with the MARC, Men Advocating for Real Change training that we have done. We have trained nearly 90% of our executives. We made a goal that we're gonna take it out to all frontline managers by the end of next year. It teaches all of us that we have biases and it's how you respond to those. And it's what you do to lead your teams through those and recognize that the world is a better place. Business outcomes are great when you have diverse thinking that you can enable. And corporations are just better places when individuals can come in and feel that they can be themselves and really contribute to, to the, the, the company and the organization. We also have a very, very robust employee resource group. Our, our Women in, in Action resource group is the largest resource group that we have. It is 13,000 employees strong. We have 40 chapters around the world. We are using that employee resource group to fundamentally help drive some of the policy changes around paid time, time off, around enabling our flexible work from home solutions. We have, we, we clearly see that technology can enable how women and men can work from home. We have sites across Dell where nearly 50% of the workforce works from home one or two days out of, the, out of the week. And this has actually been a huge enabler for us to hire women back into the workforce that have taken some time off that have children, that their children are getting older and they want to come back. And there is an untapped potential labor pool that is out there of women that have master's degrees, that have started their own businesses, that we are actually rehiring back at Dell. And they're um, continuing to lead you know, major, major organizations and, and functions for us. And a lot of that is enabled through a lot of these, these practices. No wonder you won the Working Mother of the Year, 2012, the award by the mother, Working Mother magazine, because the work-life balance, I think, you talked about. So Sherry, going back to you, um, when you launched your foundation in 2008, you talked about how women being a part of the workforce is going to lead to stronger economies. You want to elaborate a bit on that and how and what your foundation has done to further the cause in the last nine years? Well, I think it, 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 the, the frustration I feel after, as you say, we founded the um, foundation in 2008 is that, you know, all the research we see all the time shows that by empowering women, by women um, getting engaged in the economy, that makes sort of stronger economies. McKinsey recently produced a report which said that the world GDP would increase by $28 trillion if women were given equal 
uh, access to economic opportunities that, that men have. And yet this year, the World Economics Forum Global Gender Gap showed that when it comes to women's uh, equal access to economic opportunities, we've actually gone backwards. So the, the dial hasn't gone forward, it's actually gone backwards. So what, 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 what is going on? There are clearly, it's not enough to keep producing evidence that empowering women makes a difference. We've actually got to make sure that people do something to implement these things because there are barriers. Take Here, here we are in India, um, amazing uh, country, vibrant, so much going on, and yet India has one of the lowest participations in the workforce of women in the world. Absolutely. It is right down there with the, some of the poorest countries in the world and does worse, for example, than countries like Bangladesh. Um, so only, I think it's 27% of women over the age of 15 participate in the workforce in India. Danda Kocher, Karen Quinto, Sherry Blair, Ivanka Trump, these ladies did not 